We are going to conclude Ecclesiastes tonight, and we're uh, that's the reason I don't have a whiteboard here or anything, because this is not going to take very long. It wasn't even worth getting the whiteboard out, because we're just going to be in these final um, five or six verses very, very quickly. And it's just, it's just Solomon, who I believe who wrote it, um, putting his top hat on the end of his argument here. And uh, he ends it very well, and I think we can receive some encouragement from it. So let's ask the Lord to be with us in this. Again, we're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Have your Bibles there ready, and uh, be ready to dive in together. Tonight, once again, I'll be reading from the New American Standard, um, just so you're aware of that. Let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you, and we thank you, Lord, for um, the excitement of the future. We thank you for um, the... uh, Soon we'll be able to come back together as, as a part of, just a small part, but a part of the body of Christ. And, and um, we look forward to seeing brothers and sisters, Lord, and encouraging one another. And, and uh, it's an exciting thing. And we thank you for that, Lord. Lord, we thank you as well for your word, um, for the privilege it is to focus our lives on that, to learn from it. And we pray, Lord, that um, as we conclude our study in Ecclesiastes tonight, that you will guide and direct our thoughts, the direction that we go, and Father, um, have our, not just our ears um, and our intellects open, but Father, our souls open to what we hear. Um, help us to know, Father, if there's change that needs to take place, and by your Spirit, bring about that change in our lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, if you remember last week, we, uh, we looked a little bit at the golden years, and they did, uh, Solomon did not paint them with a very golden brush by any means. Um, and he, he, his, as, as, we, as we looked towards, even last week, at the conclusion of this, and, and what, uh, what our author told us is basically to enjoy youth. Um, because the days are coming when things will change. And not only that, um, the days of darkness are coming, and that darkness being referred to was death. And uh, so, as, as we conclude after, after that, that focus on youth, and as we conclude now with, he's writing, as you will see here, specifically, as seemingly to his son, a son of his youth, and who's in his youth, and he's going to give him some very good advice to, to wrap things up here. Um, as we look to these verses, we're just going to read them in a section and then we'll break them down a little bit. Um, again, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, beginning of verse 9, it says this. In addition to being a wise man, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, and he pondered, searched out, and arranged many proverbs. The preacher sought to find delightful words and to write the words of truth correctly. The words of wise men are like goats, and masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. But beyond this, my son, be warned, in the writing of many books is endless and excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. In the conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. For God will bring to every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. All right, so as we conclude this, what we see here is the author referring to himself in this way, possibly. This is one other one of those parts of Ecclesiastes where you see a little bit of the debate of who exactly wrote this. As I told you as we started this, oh goodness, clear back in the, the, the beginning of January, um, what we took a look at was that there are those who believe that Ecclesiastes was written at a much later date than the life of Solomon, and they just kind of brought Solomon into it and, and, and referred to some of his proverbs and, and referred to his wisdom and kind of wrote under a suit them almost of Solomon in regard to him. Um, That's not what I believe. I believe that it was written by Solomon. Um, If you believe it wasn't and written at a time later, you would see that the preacher now is referring Koalith, who is the author, the editor, if you will, is looking back um, and he is writing about the preacher here and the preacher's words and the preacher's proverbs and the preacher's study and the preacher's advice. That is the viewpoint of some uh, that saying Solomon wasn't the author. Now, 
again, my viewpoint, I believe he was the author. And what I see in this is just Solomon referring to himself in third person. You see that a number of times um, throughout the Old Testament, so it wouldn't be anything unusual. Regardless of all of that, um, what we come down to in these words in verse 9, let's see what, instead of just talking about who wrote it, let's see what they wrote. Um, In addition to being a wise man, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, and he pondered and searched out and arranged many proverbs. That word um, in the Hebrew, arranged many proverbs, is literally straightened. He straightened many proverbs. The exact same word used earlier in Ecclesiastes talking about man cannot straighten what God has bent. Um, so it's, it, just, it just means that. It means straightened out, um, to put in order, if you will. And what he says here is the preacher saw it. He, he looked through Proverbs, probably not just his own, but other Proverbs of the age and of the time, too, seeking and looking for wisdom within them. And that's the culmination of what we see in Ecclesiastes, him seeking out things like this. Well, he's done this. He's searched, he's pondered, he's searched it out, he's arranged them. What did he find out? Well, verse 10, the preacher sought to, de- sought to find delightful words and write words of truth correctly. So what he wanted to do was to take those Proverbs and draw from them delightful words. Literally, that means pleasurable words. And then he wants to write them accurately or truthfully. So what we have here is a combination of two things. We have... Coalith, we have the preacher, the author, seeking these words, seeking this wisdom, and not just writing it out truthfully, but doing it in a colorful way. Um, Ecclesiastes is a very colorfully written um, oh, essay, if you will, about life. And, and what we see here is him being very clever in the way he words things and the word plays he uses sometimes. We've already talked about that at length. Um, but not only that, is he clever in the way he says what he says, what he says is also truth. So that's a very powerful combination, and one of the reasons why Ecclesiastes is such a, um, not just a powerful book, but also a popular book of the Bible. Verse 11, the words of wise men are like goads, and masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They are given by one Shepherd. So we have words, wise words. We have the words used by wise men, and they're used in such a way in this verse, saying that the wise, they, um, these words that they use are like goads. Now you might wonder what a goad is. You know, a goat is what's a goad. A goad. Well, they're actually kind of related. A goad was basically a long staff or a stick. Um, the end of it would either be pointed, or as we'll see in the other part of this verse. Um, it might have um, a nail in it embedded into the end of it. And it was used for livestock to get oxen um, to move, goat, sheep, whatever it might be, mainly oxen because they were quite stubborn. And, and so it was a tool. It was something to get livestock moving, and it did not feel good. And look what it says next. Masters of these collections, so the collections of wisdom, the collections of Proverbs. It's not talking about the collections. It's talking, if you look here at this verb and what it refers to, it's talking about the masters. Masters of these collections, these masters are like well-driven nails. In other words, that nail in the end of the goad is like these wise people, these wise men, who knows, it might be wise women, who, who use their words in such a way, sometimes they're painful, but they are beneficial to those who hear them and who act upon them. And what our author does next, Koalith, is he says, these, these, these goads that are being used, these wise men that use their words like goads, or these sharp nails are like the actual masters who are saying words to move people along in a good direction. They are shepherds, but they're under shepherds. They're shepherdlings almost, if you will. And they all come under the authority of one shepherd. Notice shepherd in your Bible if it doesn't use shepherd, it may perhaps a different word, pastor, or something like that, minister. Um, shepherd is capitalized. It is referring to the creator. It is referring to God. So the words of the wise, they can be painful. They can be frustrating. They can be aggravating. But when used wise words are spoken by wise people, they are spoken in such a way to provide direction 
encouragement. Sometimes uh, the kick in the seat of the pants we need that doesn't feel all that great um, to go the direction in which we need to go. Verse 12 follows. This is an interesting verse that follows it. It says this, But beyond this, my son, be warned. The writing of many books is endless, and the excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. Any college student, or perhaps even a high school student, would say amen to that, maybe memorize that verse. I can remember uh, many of nights in college, I would have heartily agreed with verse 12. Uh, But there's a little more to it than just what meets the eye. What Koalith, the preacher, is saying here to his son is this. He's he's saying specifically what has already been written, the words of wisdom, the pen that has already been put to paper, at the guidance of the shepherd, the creator, written word, wise, holy written word, is more than adequate for you to find direction in your life. Don't don't be searching during these other paths, these other books, these other writings that don't have the power and contain the wisdom found in the words of these wise people. Uh, It is very interesting here, and and I think a little bit more advice that that Koalith is giving to his son is this, is is these, these... Wise words, even the good ones, the ones that are given by these under shepherds, the, 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 it is this, it is, these words are not primarily for the intellectual growth of the readers or to broaden their horizons, if you will. That is not the primary purpose of this wisdom. The primary purpose of this wisdom, it is designed so that we may live well before God. That is the culmination of so much work that we find in Ecclesiastes, the work of the preacher, Koalith, searching for wisdom, searching for purpose, searching for direction. In life, and the conclusion he comes to is this, verse 13. The conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. I've written in my Bible behind that verse this the good life. You know, it's interesting how this fits in. Just this morning, I was meeting with a group of guys. And uh, typically we meet in a donut shop. It's, we call it Donuts and Devos. We haven't been in a donut shop for quite some time. Matter of fact, we haven't even met for quite some time before the last couple of weeks. And when we've come, come together, it's such a small group, and we try to keep our distance just a little bit. And as we were there studying actually through um, 2 Corinthians is what we were looking through. And it's funny how it relates to what is being said right here because part of our discussion this morning was this, how the law of God is truly a gift. It truly is. And actually, I should take that back. We're reading in um, Galatians. And in Galatians, you have a group of people who were leaning upon the law for more than, than just the direction that the law points us towards God or the law that lives within us. A little bit more that, about that here in a second. What the people in, of Galatia were doing that Paul was writing to them about, and he wasn't happy with them, is they were trying to take the gospel, which is Jesus came, he died, he was buried, and he rose again, and it's the power by which we are saved. He, by that earned the right to not only save us from our sins, but also earned the right to be our Lord. And what the Galatians were doing was they were taking a part of the law, specifically circumcision, and trying to put that on top of what the gospel said. Jews were doing this to Gentiles, saying, Jesus isn't enough, you also need to be circumcised if you want to be a part of the body of Christ. Paul was incredibly upset with that. So the whole whole letter of Galatians is Paul talking about Christ is adequate. He is enough. So what do we do with the law then? What do we do with the law? Because the law has a lot to do with what we've been reading even here in Ecclesiastes. And Jesus did not say he came to abolish the law. Jesus came to fulfill the law. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount did not destroy the law. It took the law and made the law even more difficult to fall in line with. You see, the problem isn't the law. The problem's us. We can't follow it. We can't find any type of gain with God 
In other words, we cannot raise our status with God by observing law. So what is the purpose of the law? Is it merely a curse? No, 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 no. The law points us toward Jesus, but here's the other thing. The law also is a gift to God's people. It was a gift to his people in the Old Testament. Now, they didn't find salvation through it, but it put a stamp on the people of Israel saying, if they were observing that law, that they were observing it because of God. All right? Jesus said something to a different group of people because he changed things when he came here. The way he worded it in his Sermon on the Mount is in this way. He said, let your light shine before men so that they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You see, the law, or I guess more specifically what we're looking at, wise words here, the words that are designed so that we may live well before God, Those words are put in place, and if we will put those words to practice within us and put God's law within us, that is the good life. It is a gift. It is protection. It is keeping us from a whole lot of heartache down the line and consequences to horrible decisions. You see, wisdom, wise words... I guess you could broaden that out to the law of God is a gift to God's people. And the good life is this, fear God, keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. And then verse 14 is just some added extra motivation. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. And right there we have our conclusion to Ecclesiastes. Appreciate so much all of you hanging in and studying through this. We started here in this room. Um, We finished through a camera, but that's all right. We still were able to gain that information. I look forward to next fall starting another chunk of God's Word. I'm not sure where we'll go yet, but we'll do something very similar in this room next fall. And I hope you've gained um, something valuable for your life. Uh, for our study through Ecclesiastes. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we come before you. Thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the work it has done in our lives. And we pray, Father, it will continue to work in our lives when combined by the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you for your law. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. We'll see you next time, church.